Hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture combining the arrhythmias with myocardial ischemia and today we are discussing bradyarrhythmias with acute coronary syndrome. We are going to understand today the types of bradyarrhythmias that can occur in acute coronary syndrome and myocardial infarction and what are their mechanisms. Of course, we remind ourselves with this code that we mentioned in the last lecture, ischemic heart disease can present by everything in cardiology from S to S, from silent to sudden cardiac death. And as we discussed the last time, the tachy arrhythmia today, we are focusing on the bradyarrhythmia. arrhythmia. Just to remind ourselves, we mentioned in the lectures of classification bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia that they are classified into two types, disorders in impulse generation, which are the sinus node dysfunction, and disorders in impulse conduction related to AV blocks. We know, of course, that SA node disease is a plus supply from the RCA in 67% of population and from LCX in 30 to 40% of the population whereas the AV node receives a plus supply from the right coronary in about 80% of the individuals and 20% it receives from LCX. This means that if one of these two vessels are affected in myocardial infarction, for example, this may affect the SA nodal function or AV node. That's why presiorrhythmia may occur in the context of myocardial infarction due to affection of their blood supply. The question that forces itself on our minds, why presiorrhythmia are always common with inferior STEMI? There are two mechanisms for this. The first one is the vagal stimulation, which is a part of basal gyrus reflex. With inferior stimuli, there is a lot of vagal stimulation, leading to sinus bradycardia, which is very common to be seen in inferior stimuli. So part of it is just vagal stimulation. And the second one is that the RCA, which is a culprit in most of the cases on inferior stimuli, gives blood supply to SA node in 60% of cases and to AB node in 80% of cases. That's why it is often reversible after successful revascularization. So bradyarrhythmia are, have one of two explanations, the vagal simulation due to visual gyrus reflex or the affection of their perfusion. Of course, the most common type of bradyarrhythmia is the sinus bradycardia, which can be seen in patients with myocardial ischemia, in which we could see that the heart rate is less than 60, there is persistent P wave with normal axis and morphology, so mostly they are rising from an SA node. That's why in order to sign the sinus bradycardia, we need to see the 12 lead ECG. It is regular, of course, and with one-to-one -one AV relationship, because the problem here is not in the AV node, it is in the SA nodes. Of course, also in many cases, you can see the inferior STEMI itself with the sinus bradycardia, as we can see here, that there is evidence of steel elevation in the inferior leads with cervical depression 1 AVL and with sinus bradycardia. The second type of sinus nodes function that may occur in the context of myocardial ischemia is the sinus pose, as we can see here, because if you affect the blood supply of the SA node, this may lead to intermittent poses in the SA node relating to the sinus poses in the 12 lead ACG. And we learned before how to measure the length of sinus pose, which is the distance from the last P wave before the interval to the first appearing P wave in milliseconds. So it is a PP interval. So sinus poses may be seen, of course, in patients with myocardial ischemia. And of course, this is very dangerous sign because it may degenerate to bradyacystole because if the occlusion to the carpet vessel is resistant at the time the patient may develop bready systole. Regarding the AV blocks, all types of AV block can occur in acute myocardial function starting from first degree up to third degree AV block. So for example here we can see here that the patient has evidence of frank inferior STEMI and the PR in server is more than one large square so here we have evidence of first degree AV block on top of inferior STEMI. In this ACG, we can see a C elevation in the inferior leads and a T elevation also in the lateral leads. We can see a C depression in V1, V2, but it doesn't fulfill the criteria for posterior STEMI. But what is also remarkable here is that the patient has clustering of pates as with gradual prolongation of P wave followed by non-conductive P wave leading to this clustering of pates suggestive of Fuenki pack phenomenon which is second degree if you block MOPS type 1 on top of infralateral STEMI. So we can see second degree MOPS type 1 in patient with acute myocardial infarction. In this HCG as well, there is a peculiar type of bradyarrhythmia. We can see the ST elevations in inferior leads here, but also we can see an evidence of 2 to 1 AV block. We can see a P wave that is just after the T wave, which is not conducted through the AV node. So we have evidence of 2 to 1 AV block on top of inferior STEMI. We know, of course, that 2 to 1 AV block may be MOBIS type 1, 
maybe Mobus type 2 and we explain this in the lecture of AV blocks. So this patient have a more advanced form of bradyarrhythmia due to inferior STEMI. In this ECG, we can see here that we have evidence of bradycardia with, with absence of P waves and the heart rate is less than 60 beat per minute. So here we are speaking about another different type of bradyarrhythmia, which is escape juncture rhythm. So here the SA nodes stop to function or to pace the heart and that's why another escape rhythm is now taking over the responsibility for pacing the heart, which is a junction rhythm, but unfortunately, it is escape rhythm and the heart rate is less than 60 beat per minute. Here is another example of an ECG that have a striking feature. We can see an evidence of P waves that are completely dissociated from the complex. So we have an evidence of complete dissociation due to third degree AV block. You may focus on this and just arrange or schedule this patient to have urgent temporary pacemaker insertion, but you forget that there is an another striking feature which is the ST elevation in inferior leads because this patient has third degree AV block on top of inferior STEMI. This is a very common mistake in the ER that once you see this ECG, you are focusing on the striking feature of the bradycardia and you forget to, to assess whether there's an evidence on fear STEMI or not, which may be the cause for complete heart block. Because this patient will not need permanent pacemaker, he will need just correction of this primary inferior STEMI by opening the culprit vessel and in this case the complete heart block will result. So here we have the highest grade of AV block in patient with inferior STEMI. In, in this ACG as well, we can see an evidence of complete AV dissociation on top of inferior STEMI. So here we can see an evidence of inferior STEMI complicated by third degree AV block. The question that we sometimes ask ourselves, does this mean that in complete heart block doesn't occur in anterior STEMI? The answer is no, it can occur. Here we can see an evidence of C elevation in the inferior leads, but also there is combined C elevation in the anterior leads, which may suggest anterior STEMI. And here there is an evidence of complete AV dissociation. Anterior STEMI, in most of the cases, the culprit vessel is the LED, which gives origin to septal perforators supplying the bundle branch and the fascicular branch inside the interventricular septum. So anterior STEMI, in some cases, may lead like a pattern of infrahissian AV block. So, complete heart block may occur in anterior STEMI as well. But there is a difference between the two patterns of AV block and anterior STEMI or inferior STEMI. Inferior STEMI mostly it is reversible after successful revascularization and so it has a good prognosis. Whereas in anterior STEMI it is usually irreversible even after successful revascularization because it is related to ischemic necrosis of the Hesperkinji system itself like the bundle branch or the fascicular branches. So remember, in any patient with high-grade AV block, exclude ECG features of myocardial ischemia before jumping to a diagnosis of irreversible AV block caused by degenerative disease. Because in case that this patient is considered to be irreversible, we would need permanent pacemaker. But if you diagnosed that the patient has, for example, non-STEMI or inferior STEMI, in this case, revascularization would resolve the problem, and so this patient would need just temporary pacemakers that would be removed after successful revascularization. Let's see this peculiar type of arrhythmia. Here we can see an evidence of P wave that sometimes occur before the complex, sometimes within the complex, sometimes just after the complex. What is this type of arrhythmia? Yes, I know that many of you are thinking about it now. Is isorhythmic AV dissociation. We remember the word of isorhythmic AV dissociation as we discussed it in a spin-off lecture before, and you will find the link in the description of the video below, and you will find it also in the cards. The isorhythmic means that the atrium and the ventricle have the same rate, and AV dissociation means that they are working independently from each other. So where is the problem? Either it is a problem due to accelerated juncture rhythm competing with a slowing down sinus rhythm without AV nodal disease, and in this case it is just like a P9 competition between sinus rhythm and juncture rhythm, or it is complete AV block, but the patient here doesn't have escape juncture rhythm, no, it is accelerated juncture rhythm, and that's why the patient is not brady. 
cardiac or rarely edge ventricular rhythm below the region of that blockade. So this is like an unusual presentation of third degree AV block in which the atrial rate is the same as the ventricular rate because in most cases of complete AV block, the ventricular rate would be less than the atrial rate and it would be predicardic, but here they are the same. And it can occur falling in fear STEMI or even non STEMI. So isorhythmic AV dissociation, once you diagnose it, you need to exclude myocardial ischemia as well because it's one of the famous causes. If the perfusion of the AV node is affected, it may lead to this type of arrhythmia, which is the isorhythmic AV dissociation. So remember, pre-arrhythmia occurring in the context of myocardial ischemia are usually reversible in most of the cases, not in all cases, of course. But if successful revascularization is performed at the proper time, they would just need temporary pacing in case of hemodynamically unstable ones, but no need for permanent pacemakers. And if they are still persistent after 7 to 10 days, after the revascularization, in this case, the patient may need a permanent pacemaker because I expect that maybe complete necrosis or irreversible necrosis of the AV node has occurred and so the patient may need permanent pacemaker. So sometimes if you are delayed in revascularization, the patient may have irreversible damage to the AV node or the SA node and so he may need to have a permanent pacemaker and we need to assess this after about 7 to 10 days because till this period, complete resolution of the preterismia may occur. So at the end of this lecture, we understood today the types of mechanisms of pre-arrhythmia that occur in the setting of acute myocardial ischemia like in non-EC elevation, acute coronary syndrome or STEMI and take home message, always exclude myocardial ischemia, especially in fear STEMI in any patient with pre-arrhythmia, whatever the type, whatever the severity of pre-arrhythmia, always check whether there is myocardial ischemia or not. Thank you very much for your watching.